Good morning. Welcome to our worship at Christmas Lutheran. Today is the fifth Sunday after Pentecost. We'll be following the order of service. Yeah. claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I confess that I am sinful by nature, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord by singing Him 549.
in you, mercifully hear our prayers, be gracious to us in our weakness, and give us strength to keep your commandments in all we say and do. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Job 38. So, just a little background on this. The Bible is really great in talking about Job's faith, faith, how he was accepting all that the Lord had allowed to happen to him. And, uh, you, know, you know, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised or blessed be the name of the Lord. Um, his wife told him, curse God and die at one time. Um, his faith was so strong but the temptations finally got to him, and he sinned. He sinned and sort of letting God have it with his words. And this is God's answer. And uh, he definitely put Job and all of us who complain about him in our place. <laughs> cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. Who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb when I made the cloud its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness? When I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place? When I said, this far you may come and no further, here is where your proud waves halt. This Includes our first lesson. These are the words of our Lord. Thanks be to God.
Shiloh king as I was on the road. I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Then I asked, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen of me and what I will show you. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven, first to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and to the Gentiles also, I preached that they should repent and turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. That is why the Jews seized me in their temple courts and tried to kill me. But I have had God's help to this very day, and so I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Christ would suffer, and as the first to rise from the dead would, would proclaim light to his own people and to the Gentiles. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You are out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. I am not insane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. What I am saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these, these things and I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it was not done in a corner. These are the words of our Lord. Thanks be to God. We invite our children up for the children's sermon. How are you today? You good? Okay, this isn't so much a sermon as it is a story, okay? I'm trying to think about how old I was when this story happened. I was maybe a couple years older than you when I was a boy. So one of our members blessed us with a, with a week at their lake cabin every summer. So we went up there one summer. This lake is huge. So up and down, north and south, it's 24 miles. <laughs> Wide, it's 18 miles. You can just barely see a teeny tiny bit of the trees on the other side of the lake. So my dad liked walleye fishing. And there was a walleye spot about three miles out onto the lake. And my dad sort of knew exactly where it was because he had been there many times. Because there were little buoys out in the water because it was shallow. So he said, let's go fishing. So we went out and unfortunately, he missed where the three mile mark was and we kept going and he must have been talking or something or listening to a twins game or who knows what and we just kept going and then he realized it and he says, well let's go over to the other side and see if we can find a place there so we're about eh, somewhere around 15 miles across the lake in our little little boat that just has a little Put putt motor and we're fishing and I always tried to beat my dad in fishing. He was ahead of me two to one, two to one walleye. And then all of a sudden, off in the distance, we saw a black cloud, a big line of black clouds. And he, we said, ooh, we gotta get back. And we start, we had the, boat going as absolutely fast as we could go and a severe thunderstorm hit us while we were in the middle of the lake and the waves 
must have been at least that high. I couldn't see much over a wave when we went down in between the waves. And my dad told me, go to the front of the boat. And he said, I want you to curl, curl up. I want you to weigh down the front of the boat so it doesn't go way up in the air. So I went there and I was sort of like this for quite a long time. My dad must, must have been an expert boatman. It was a long time getting back over there. By the time we got back, the storm was pretty much gone. We had survived the worst of it. But it was an experience I never forgot. And I think, I think God taught me that he's in charge. And now that I look back, I think God figured he had plans for both me and my father. And he wanted us to make it because it could have been easily, our boat could have flipped over and we would have been in the middle of the lake. So today we're going to learn about Jesus being on the water, calming the storm. So I was talking about God has a plan for us. So he and I could have died, could have drowned in the middle of that lake. But my dad had at least 20 years of being a pastor yet to go. And I had 38, 39 years of being a pastor. And he used him and me to, through the Holy Spirit, to bring people to faith, to baptize people, to teach people God's word, keep them in the faith. He had those plans for us and he kept us safe. And I want you to think about that, because sometimes you're going to have some things, bad things happen to you in life, and you're going to wonder why. And my answer is, God has a, his plan. Trust him. Okay? That's my lesson to you this morning. No matter what things in life may happen to you or to your loved ones, God always has a plan. Even if we would have passed away, if we would have drowned in the middle of that lake, God would have had a plan. That would be how he would have taken us to heaven. So there, nothing bad would have happened. He had it all in his hands, his loving hands. So let's trust him with our things in life, okay? I could never read this gospel reading without that story coming into my mind. It, there's so much similarity um, because, because of the side of the lake. Actually, Malak in Minnesota is much bigger than the Sea of Galilee. Only there's different circumstances that I'll talk about in the sermon. So the Holy Gospel is totally the correct. It's correct in saying Mark chapter 4, but the reading's wrong. So I'll have you listen to me today. That day when evening came, he, Jesus, said to his disciples, Let us go to the other side, leaving the crowd behind. They took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. These are the words of our Lord, we continue with the next hymn, number 849, Lord, take my hand and lead me. Lord, take my hand and lead me. Oh, 
star of the movie was Kevin Costner, and the movie was called The Guardian. I don't know how, if any of you remember that movie at all. The Coast Guard is a very important branch of our armed forces. They have been called to help at many times during major storms, helping rescue people out on the ocean or the great, one of the Great Lakes. As men and women who see and experience firsthand the power and force of storms at sea, the members have a great respect for the Almighty God's control over wind and wave. Many of you are aware of the motto of the Marines, Semper Fi, or Always Faithful. Maybe you aren't so aware of the motto for the Coast Guard, Semper Paratus, or Always Ready. I'm going to use that motto as a part of our sermon theme for this morning. Jesus is always ready to answer our call for help. The gospel writer Mark is one of the best gospel writers with presenting our Savior Jesus in action, sharing stories from Jesus' life which display his power and might as the Son of God. Being also, going to the story, being also true man, as well as true God, Jesus is incredibly tired after a day of preaching and teaching. Jesus suggests to his disciples that they go by boat over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee so that they can have some peace and quietness, get a little rest. Jesus, being quite tired, <laughs> falls asleep within minutes from experience, maybe even seconds. <laughs> with the width of the Sea of Galilee, so that lake I was on was 18 miles across. The width of the Sea of Galilee is eight miles. But if you didn't have a motor, it was still a pretty long trip. So while Jesus is sleeping, a violent storm erupts on the sea. I once read an article about storms on the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is like in a bowl. The sea itself is 600 feet below sea level. And the hills around the sea can tower over 2,000 feet above the sea. I want you to think of 2,000 feet. So, the highest mountain in Wisconsin, I think, is Rib Mountain up by Wausau, and it's 2,100 feet above sea level. So that's like being down at New Orleans, and then you go all the way up. If you drive by Rib Mountain, which I have, it looks pretty tall but you're also pretty high above sea level where you're driving on the road. 2,100 feet, uh, I was trying to think what I've seen there. So you're going to Colorado. Where you are, you look at those mountains, you go up to Estes Park, it's about 2,100 feet above where the where you start going up, so it's quite a quite a way going up, and some of the sea, some of that is right along the Sea of Galilee. So so you have have cliffs and things like that. So what happens is off to the east it would be of the Sea of Galilee. So I guess if you're looking at the sea, it would be on that side, away from Nazareth. That's desert. So it gets really hot. And if you get a good wind blowing that hot air across the cool air, 2,000 feet below uh, from the Sea of Galilee, you have a big mix 
and it sometimes causes storms that have hurricane strength winds. And let's add to that, the Sea of Galilee is also quite shallow, which means the waves can really kick up. Nothing is safe. Many of Jesus' disciples made their living from being fishermen on the Sea of Galilee. They were experienced in handling boats in poor weather conditions. But soon these fishermen were scared to death. The seas were so rough and the wind so strong that the waves came over the side of the boat. Water started coming in and it scared them terribly. Unbelievably, Jesus is still asleep on a cushion in the stern. Mark tells us, the disciples woke him up pleading, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? They had done everything they could think of to keep themselves and everyone safe, and it wasn't enough. They needed help from the Almighty. The same story is told by the Gospel writer Matthew. Matthew tells us that before calming the storm, Jesus had a few words for his disciples. You of little faith, why are you so afraid? Interesting words coming from the one who is sleeping. <laughs> why are you so afraid? This was a moment of teaching that Jesus could not pass by. Does that seem, all of you who've experienced life, that sometimes God's sleeping? That he's unconcerned with what's going on because you're praying, you're, think, you're in trouble, and no help. Nothing's coming your way. I think that's what was going through the disciples. It was a moment that the disciples would always remember. Mark wasn't there in the boat, but we're pretty sure that it was Peter telling Mark the stories that he should put in the Bible. Jesus needed them to know the spiritual reason for what was happening and then pass it to us. Jesus had two things he had to handle. One's very obvious, the storm, but he had the faith of the disciples to handle as well actually the more important of the two problems. Their faith needed to learn and to be strengthened. It would help them well in the years to come, especially thinking about the fact that 11 of the 12 disciples were martyred. They died out of faith for their Lord. They needed to know Jesus was with them. So after speaking to the disciples, Jesus actually spoke to the waves. Quiet, be still. Jesus used words that we might say to our dog or cat. <laughs> when they insist on making a racket. So telling the storm to be still is no different than me telling my dogs to be quiet when someone rings the doorbell. And the storm actually listened, as opposed to my dogs. <laughs> At that very moment, Mark tells us, then the wind died down and it was completely calm. That's a miracle in itself. So the wind can calm down really fast once in a while as a front comes through. It's through and just goes calm really fast. But have you ever seen a completely calm pool when someone does a cannonball in the middle of it? it there's waves and they just keep going and going for quite a while. The same is true for a storm on the lake. But here, the water becomes calm immediately. So not only the storm, but the lake itself was calm. That's the greatness of Jesus' power at work. 
It is because Jesus has such great power that all of us who believe in him can have our hearts be calm when the storms of life come our way. Even after it was all over, the disciples were still trembling, only this time for an additional reason. Yes, they were still trembling from having gone through that terrible experience of potentially losing their lives on the lake or on the sea, but now they were also trembling from seeing the great power of the Lord Jesus. Jesus said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. So they were sort of at odd just from seeing the great power of our Lord Jesus. Jesus used this event in the lives of his disciples to teach them. He wanted them to be confident about anything, to come to him in prayer. Not with a question mark, but in faith, in trust. And there's a difference. One is help, wondering if it's going to come. And then there's the help with the confidence and ex expectation that it will come. Jesus also always wanted them to remember the first, the theme for our sermon, Jesus is always ready to answer our call for help. He is semper paratus, always ready. Mark was a young lad during the days of Jesus' ministry. He was so taken by the great things that Jesus could do and he wanted to share those experiences told to him by Peter and share them with as many who, who would read his words and the Holy Spirit helped Mark accomplish great things so that we listen to his words even today. Mark's readers, you and I, face trouble in our lives. Each of us have our own individual troubles. Some of them can really test one's faith. Some of us here this morning are even experiencing them now. How reassuring it is to see Jesus' power and authority even over nature itself. Jesus speaks and nature obeys perfectly. With every trouble that comes our way, two questions always come our way as well. What will, it, what will our answer be? Fear or trust? Fear or trust? Back during the season of Lent, as we remember Jesus facing his enemies who would torture him and crucify him, we see Jesus trusting his Father. We can see the trust in his words, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus showed us the way we should go, even in the face of death. We want to trust that the Father will take care of us and save us. When things are going wrong, when the news is bad, how often don't we find ourselves, like the disciples, afraid of the future with fear filling our heart? And then maybe a pastor, maybe a friend, maybe remembering a Bible story like Jesus calming the sea reminds us that we have every reason to give ourselves to the Lord, put ourselves in his hands, and trust. That's what faith is, trusting in the Lord Jesus, trusting him for the forgiveness of our sins, trusting in him for eternal life in heaven, trusting him to watch over us body and soul and make sure that everything turns out for our good. Jesus is always ready to answer us when we call. Amen. Please, please rise. And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us confess our Christian faith according to the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. 
I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We also pray. Dear kind and loving Father, we thank you for your gracious will that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We give you thanks that your will has been done in us, that you have called us to eternal life through faith in your Son. Use us to speak your saving word to others, that they may also be called to faith by the Holy Spirit. Father, it's your holy will that all believers live a sanctified life free of sin, in your word, you have shown us what we are to do and not to do in order to please you. But temptations do pour in upon us from every side. The devil is always busy seeking to lead us into sin and unbelief. And we must confess that our spiritual enemies often, cause a, often lead us astray. We sin each day. Gracious Father, we ask you to forgive our sins, pleading the merits of Jesus our Savior and his innocent suffering and death on the cross. And we ask you to help us always be trusting to you, trust in you for all that happens in our lives, even, even the bad ones. Help us to place ourselves into your hands when everything seems to go against, against us. Teach us to accept in humble faith any burden that in your fatherly wisdom you ask us to bear. May your will always be done among us for Jesus' sake. Amen. And we also pray for the family of Pam Hoyer, whose father, Del Schoenbeck, passed away this last week. We pray, O oh Lord. God, Lord of life and death, we thank you for all the mercies with which you blessed our believer now fallen asleep. We thank you for, especially for having brought Del to the knowledge of your son, Jesus Christ. We pray that you would comfort his family and all who mourn his death with your precious promises and cheer them with the sure hope of a blessed reunion in heaven. Grant the lifeless body rest and at last together with us all a joyful resurrection to life everlasting. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain hearts of wisdom and finally be saved. Through Jesus Christ, our risen and ever-living Lord. We also pray for the Jacob family who are traveling this week to be at the International Youth Rally in Colorado. Grant them safe travel. May your Holy Spirit teach them things to strengthen their faith in you, we ask that you help them enjoy this trip as a family, and we ask you to bless all who are in attendance. We ask these things in Jesus' name. In his name we also pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We continue with our next hymn.
Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We continue with our final hymn, one of which was left over from our Father's Day choices. Amen. 